Hello. This is a Ting Screen podcast, and today I went to a gallery for the first time in over a year. Um, it was a a kind of delicious experience. Um, I've been waiting to go to a gallery for a long time without a lot of the restrictions. Of course, those restrictions are still in place in a sense, but it does feel that things have opened up a little bit. So I chose out of all, well, well the, the limited amount of spaces I could go to in Dublin, I chose um, Complex. And there, Tana Aaron and Mark Swords have collaborated on a show entitled Portico. If you look up the definition of portico, um, you get something like uh, a covered entrance, usually for an impressive building uh, with columns. So that definition leads to other signifiers like temperature, uh, history, civilization, um, the Mediterranean perhaps. Um, and I get that association really with Mark Sword's paintings, who, because he's someone I know personally, he has a connection with the Mediterranean. Um, I think he perhaps fantasizes about it in a way through his work. But I won't go, in, go into too much depth in relation to that. Um, whereas Tanit Aaron is an artist I know through collaboration with other artists such as Tom Watt and Andreas von Knobloch. Um, I don't really see him or uh, understand him in an individual context, whereas Mark Swords I would. Mark Swords is a painter uh, or is known as a painter. And like Portico, if you try and define painter, you may come up with words like solipsistic, individual, uh, isolated, um, uh, a kind of a solo show. Um, whereas when I think of other artists, you know, multimedia artists or mixed media artists or whatever they are, you know, film, sculpture, there is a sociability about those artists where collaboration can take place. Whereas painting, I've always seen it in a solo context, uh, a, a certain type of temperament that um, denotes uh, individuality. So, the exhibition. Well, I went to Dublin tentatively because I hadn't been in a big city for over a year. So I really didn't know what to expect outside uh, complex, you know, on the way there. So there was a lot of things to go through. Get on the Lewis, uh, navigate all that stuff in, in relation to, you know, sanitize your masks, other people uh, in a, a claustrophobic environment especially there was a good few on the loose so I went through all those things and I arrived at complex and uh, it was empty except for uh, someone at the door uh, and that was the co-director uh, of complex and so I had the space to myself for a good 20 minutes um, two or three people walked in and walked back out but that was it. Um, there were some noises because it's attached to a studio, um, a studio complex where artists are going up and down the stairs. You could, you could hear that. You could hear activity beyond the gallery. But other than that, it's very quiet. If you haven't been to complex, um, it's a kind of a square room, and it isn't a white-walled gallery space. Uh, the walls look like they're crumbling. Uh, but there's no dust. Uh, it's um, a very sealed in crumbling going on there. 
So uh, on the surface uh, or from a distance, you feel that the thing has been bandaged up. Uh, this space has been bandaged up a lot. Um, but um, up close, it's very uh, sealed in. The dust, there's no dust or anything like that. So it's very clean and, um, and there's no smell either of damp. So that's one thing. Um, so when you enter the space, you are met by this platform that Tanadaran has made. It's about a foot uh, above the floor proper, and it's made of MDF and timber. And it's a very neat platform. It's very precise. The MDF has been lacquered. Uh, it has been treated. So it's not that light tan color, it's a kind of a darker tan uh, and it, it looks like leather. Um, uh, the edges of the MDF have been rounded off and you feel that it, it could be soft when you step on it. It isn't, of course, it's MDF. So when you step up onto the platform, there's a series of ramps. Um, it's very uniform and there's, because I was very tentative, I walked, I took a left turn and went up the ramp. I took uh, the path of least resistance. I didn't hop up onto the platform, which is easy, oh, but I walked around up onto the, uh, on, on the ramps and I, I took that path through. And, but in some sense, you only feel the work beneath your feet uh, as a physical, um, experience rather than a visual one. The visual comes later, I think, because Mark Sword's work shouts loudest. It would in this space. Um, whereas Talon's work kind of whispers beneath your feet. It's present and it makes you feel your body, uh, feel the movement of your body in relation to the work rather than a kind of dreamlike stay, state within a white space. White, go white walled gallery space. So I took the path of least resistance and I walked up the ramps up onto the platform. So you're elevated a little bit, a foot off the gallery floor proper. And it, the platform itself makes you become aware of your own body walk, walking through the space. And it leads you in, in an orderly fashion. You know, I suppose, uh, with COVID and everything, it kind of organizes you in an institutional way around the space. So you go by the rules in the beginning, well, I did anyway. And I took, I didn't just hop up onto the platform. Um, I took the path that was delineated through the space with the ramps. Um, but really, it was the upper part of my body, the visualization of things. That's that's where Mark Soar's work um, shouted loudest. So in a way, the upper half of your body is engaged with Mark Soar's work with, and the bottom half of your body is engaged with um, subliminally in a way or um, with Tanit Aaron's work. So you're kind of cut in half. You, you're, the visual feast is Mark Swords and the bodily feast is um, Tanit Aaron's work. Um, so in a way, I didn't really take notice so much of the formal aspects of the ramp and the platform. Um, because there's so much coming from Mark Sword's work. There's so much texture. There's even uh, text within the work. And that texturality, you know, as Derrida might say, is very loud uh, and very noisy because there's so much going on up close in particular. So when you pull back, you get a kind of a mishmash of color uh, and texture and form. When you go up close, uh, 
those forms start to um, project outwards and your eye starts to stumble over shapes um, badly cut uh, swaths of fabric um, PVA glue sticking out from the sides uh, poster paints acrylic um, a kind of a palette of mess and we're very well constructed in terms of there's always a kind of a framing device um, a portico around the edges so this mess is contained in some way and it's all very vertical because uh, it's portrait the paintings are portrait um, so you engage with them in a kind of human way and being aware of what's underneath your feet in terms of the platform and you're not disembodied in a, in a certain way it's a very physical experience and this is this is important when we've been begging for this we've been begging for an escape from the virtual and this exhibition comes at a time where, uh, when the physical is something that we have an appetite for so it's a very physical experience it's a very physical exhibition you know the title portico is an entrance into something uh, it involves columns there's columns in a uh, complex which Tanid has cut around with the platform so the columns sink in to the platform very preci precisely uh, and delicately uh, and carefully and the transitions through the space the ramps in and around the space bring you around fluidly even though there's gaps between very significant gaps between um, Mark Swords paintings uh, and between those gaps you have the noise uh, the crumbling edifice of uh, crumbling facade of um, complex which is not crumbling but it has the image of that uh, so um, so in a way Mark Sword's work sits into that very well into that facade um, I don't know how this would work I don't know how either of their works would work in a white walled gallery space that was as precise as talent's uh, platform um, I think it would be a very different experience it would be more dreamy uh, and there'd be less there'd be less awkwardness and less contrast perhaps um, or I don't know who would survive it, what artist would survive in this collaboration in a space like that, visually or physically. Um, thinking about that, like if this was a solo show, um, which artist would survive better? So imagine this exhibition without the platform or imagine the platform without the paintings what do you have well you have in Tana's case you have um, a mapping of space <coughs> a uniform mapping of space uh, where there's an invitation to walk up on, onto this platform and navigate around it and then in a way his work becomes more visually explicit uh, and we take more notice with that especially in the beginning and we look at how it's made uh, we feel it beneath our feet is it solid is it safe um, we look at it in relation to the complex uh, and the walls uh, and the height of the complex in relation to the lights so the lights become more apparent up, up above um, the rafters that are all exposed on top and we have a space in which um, the noise of Mark Sword's work uh, is substituted for the walls. Uh, I don't know how that works. I don't know if it does work. 
Whereas if you take out the platform, you're left with Mark Sword's work, which does the Mark Sword's thing. And I'm not trying to reduce that, but I'm saying that um, this conversation is bringing up new things in relation to Mark Sword's, you know, style. Um, and I'm not saying that Mark Sword's style is a thing that has, has not changed in recently. It, it is something that has changed dramatically, especially in recent years. And his Temple Bar show in particular have brought out a new style or a new way or a new temperament that wasn't there before. So these are the things I'm thinking about. Um, what else is there? Maybe it'd be a good idea just to watch. Uh, so, so when I went there today, I brought a camcorder. It's, it's a camcorder, it's over a decade old. And the LCD screen on it doesn't work. So there's nothing here. So I just carry it around uh, and I move with my body and I try to forget I have it. So I'm not looking at the exhibition through it. This is especially something I don't want to do now after a year being away from physical exhibitions. But um, so I brought this today um, for, I suppose I wanted to do something. I wanted to transform the way in which I, uh, I have a need to articulate exhibitions and my experience of exhibitions and to probably add to the, the writing aspect of my practice and try out new things. So that's why I brought it along. And it wasn't, um, I wasn't concerned with how the picture would come out or anything like that. This, this was secondary to just experiencing the work. And there was something pleasurable about having this recording device with no LCD screen no visual of what I, I was recording. I was, I was doing it blindly, but I was just tracking the movement of my body through the space. So I'm gonna play a bit of that and maybe that will elicit some thoughts that I had when I was there. So um, I'm gonna just try the desktop. So this is the recording I made. I'm just gonna play it. So you see at the beginning, I've walked into this space and I'm kind of going to and fro, but I've walked up onto this ramp and now I'm on the platform. It's strange how the paintings from this perspective down low uh, look huge. They're not that big, but um, you have to remember I'm holding this uh, camcorder at my waist. So it's looking up at the paintings. So in a way it's a child's view or um, just say uh, a four year old's view of these, ex these paintings and also um, a four year old's uh, view of the floor platform I never thought about this when I was doing it um, I was really attracted to this painting here and not in that instance I was trying to kind of figure out the space this is what I usually do when I go into an exhibition space I don't go directly to a work of art and try to figure it out or get closed in I try and look around uh, and take the wide angle of view um, this was one of my favorite paintings. I think it is my favorite painting. Um, it's so strange looking at this from this point of view, down low, up, because 
to get a sense of what uh, a child uh, might do in a space like this how they would see the work how it would look so huge and immense like because of my height I'm like six foot six I there was a conscious decision to see what this thing would look like down low and my arm was relaxed when I was doing it so um, I felt I forgot about it I forgot about it I forgot about the camcorder uh, in my hand so that made things better and freer It's strange how the virtual image I and mean, something that I'm very conscious of when people post work uh, on Instagram or social media that there's a, a compression of the experience uh, and we get to notice it better through the virtual. Is that better? Um, I'm not so sure because when I was with these paintings in person, they're very hard to compress into, you know, a stamp that you can actually see that you can actually uh, read whereas on the virtual uh, the, this this representation of the real on the virtual uh, it's much more illustrative is much more figurative it's much more compressed and readable well there's something else going on in the physical uh, interaction with an artwork which is hard to explain because you're dealing with your own body you're dealing with the gap between you and the object and you're dealing with all this other all this other noise that's going on you can hear people walking up and down the steps outside so this is bringing you elsewhere all the time there's 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 so much tangential thought going on when you're here memory um, speculation uh, of what's going on outside of the gallery space and in relation to the work you know what memories are evoked when you're here the memories of seeing uh, Mark Sword's work before as well and comparing and contrasting that Tanit Aaron's work was something that I was new to as an individual and uniform piece um, I was thinking about this uh, as well in relation to his collaborations with Tom Watt and Andreas von Knobloch and how that triad, that group of artists coming together, there was always a precision there. Whereas when I saw those artists work individually, something else was going on. There was a rawness to it that was more equivalent to what Mark Swords is doing here as an individual. Like this is Mark Swords work. And I know there's a collaborative piece. I uh, don't think we've seen it so far. There's a screen there where the work is done. Uh, is, is, it's a collaborative piece between Tanit and Mark. Um, and you can see Mark's stamp is the, the, the sax, those, um, those linen or whatever sax, um, you know, fruit sax or whatever they are. Um, and then Tanit's contribution to that piece is the framing um, so here I am looking at the floor and all of a sudden I've taken notice with to the floor you know I'm looking at seeing the gaps between uh, the gallery and the platform um, and but it's taken me time to notice the work um, I didn't read any artist statement. Uh, I consciously didn't do that because I just didn't want to engage with an exhibition through a text. I wanted to engage with this exhibition physically. So here, you know, I think what would happen uh, if Mark Sorr's work 
wasn't here, you would engage with, you know, the ceiling and the space around more. Um, so I've been forced to look up into the rafters and the lights in relation to Tannen's work on the floor. But I think there's something about Mark Sword's work that holds your gaze in the center. Um, like in a way, I'm trying to get into this state of absorption um, to try to lose myself in the space. But I'm kind of lost in a way. But at this point, I'm not using the ramps anymore. I'm stepping up. This is one of the columns that has sunk into the platform and you know it's cut around it. Um, there's a second column. And then there was this. Uh, I don't know if I'll pick it up, Dear X, and that's the title of the work, and that's been stamped into it. There was a sense that Tanner Aaron, because the work was so smooth and so uniform and so um, together and noiseless, it, it, was, it was whispering in the space. Uh, this is a screen as well uh, that I was talking about, the collaborative piece between Mark and Tanner. Um, that Tanit had really uh, added bits on that would create a bit of noise. So that stamped um, the title of the work that stamped at the edge there in, in whatever way, in, with a piece of metal or something. Uh, and then there's another blemish on the platform, um, which I found out later was intentional. But it looks like a circular saw has been dropped onto the platform and it's cut it um, uh, scarred it but why it it reads as intentional because there's a light in this cut that uh, peeks out at you but you feel that the work was so perfect in a way this platform is so perfect and so considered uh, this this you know perfect piece of furniture in the space that there was a desire to damage it in some way or cut it in some way. So uh, it would shout a little bit louder than a whisper. Um, but in a way, it's always present there because uh, the experience of this exhibition really is bodily and visual. Um, and the platform really positions you in the space and makes you feel your body as you step up onto it and step off it. Um, so there's a lot of uh, potential tripping. And the same with, I'm brought back to this painting again by Mark Swords. There's something about this work I, I just absolutely love. And it's not the subject matter, the infantile subject matter of, you know, dinosaurs and snail shells and the pattern. Uh, it's, I don't know, there's something deliriously hopeful about it. Um, it does feel like um, a, a fresco, you know, that, that singular tree in the center. Um, there's something about that and in this space where the walls are blackened um, there's something about civilization here in this work you know something alive and what I've always felt about Mark Sword's work is it is at his best when it's has that liveliness to it that abjection so you know abjection in terms of you can see the PVA glue being uh, underneath the uh, the swaths of fabric you can see it being squeezed out and um, mashed around uh, and there's an element of you know uh, of the organic in it liveliness um, 
they feel like posters as well um feel quite flat uh, and like patchwork there's one edge of a painting that you can see uh, birch plywood which is really unusual i thought for mark swords usually he paints on you know bits of doors and uh chipboard is as good as it gets or plywood whatever it is but um there's one painting here uh that is on birch which is a timber that feels uh, more in the repertoire of Tanid. Here's someone walking in and walking out. You get that a lot. I get that a lot in galleries where people walk in and out and that's it. Perhaps they were here before. Let's, let's not be cynical, but there is a lot of that going on where people come in, look at the, the maze and scene, you know, the, the whole thing and then walk away. Some painters talk about this, you know, I, t I don't know if it's Amy Silman or some, someone like that talk about how painting is instantaneous. It's like you, you digest it immediately and then you start to, you know, break it down in a sense. Um, and there's so much information in Mark Sword's work. It's, it's almost too much um like even the, the, the edges of it you know especially the edges the framing that he uses you'll see it there on this painting as well there's a frame uh within uh the edges of the canvas it always is it's painted in or it, it's suggesting that or it's um intimating that a frame um I don't know, is, that, is that burlap or something? There's, there's some kind of so it's a re, it's a material that um, it's really in the repertoire of Mark Swords. Kind of there's a rawness to it, unprimed. Um, like the most luxurious uh, product in Mark Swords' work is probably PDA. So it's all cheap materials, um, tearing, ripping, um, gluing on, poster paints. But somehow uh, there's, in these works in particular, there's a kind of, um, A suggestion of civilization that they're worldly that they've been they're locked into history or a conversation around history and being human um, but they are alive they're not for the archive you can see that one there sitting or it feels like it's sitting on the platform the one over to the left there This is where I lay down the camcorder uh, on this. Uh, I sat down first. I felt comfortable enough doing that. Um, and then I, I don't know what view you're going to get now, but I put down the camcorder and let it sit there and then I walked around. So you can see those bang, the banging of doors, and that's always pulling you in different directions. So you're never at peace with the work, really. You're kind of maneuvering around, and I'm not, I'm conscious of the camcorder here filming me, so I'm not walking around the way I naturally would. It's like Gerhard Richter says in that documentary, I walk differently in front of the camera.
I heard also that this exhibition will have other collaborators, which have uh, which has, has uh, it has already happened. So, you know, even though this platform suggests uh, a performance uh, and other things, in a way, I like it like this because usually these collaborative events um, force people into a position of um, produ over producing and um, does overproduction make something better or uh, and does it show uh, up the kind of vulnerability of this platform as a thing in and of itself is it enough rather than having other performers on it no you know, like um, I'm just thinking about Beckett and something like that that we don't need excess uh, even though this platform whispers I think it says enough and I'm left with that cut in the floor and it's strange I didn't film it I don't think I did anyway or do I film it now I might that cut in the floor with the light um, it seems it shows up the vulnerability uh, of the platform that it needed a cut in it that perhaps it didn't it didn't need that subjectivity so that's it um, so strangely uh, I didn't um, I didn't um, record the cut and I thought I did maybe I did and I just I just didn't point point the camera at it so there's a cut on the floor and it's one of the more enigmatic things things I'm left with and it's a question I suppose it's a question that did it need it um, we have two collaborators here one that uh, is a painter um, and one like someone who you know as i said before a painter is defined in, in a kind of solipsistic way uh, where they're working alone um, but i think i said already that mark swords uh, has always been in my mind formally a more sociable painter where he is always reaching out um, expanding painting out from the wall and that, that position of kind of pushing back pushing back the viewer not not letting them around the back to see what was going on uh, to one who um, inhabits space as well through his sculpture work and through his screens especially ones that you walk around ones that block off or ones that you walk through um, and then another artist who is used to collaborating who's used to giving over to another uh, couple of artists. So we have that tension between two artists who have very different uh, ways of working in terms of the sociability of their work. And, you know, if we were to kind of pigeonhole talent's work, it's a space that invites um, the physical body uh, to walk up onto the artwork so the artwork is activated in that way and um, and then it's subliminally um, uh, suggests things through the physical interaction with it so it's a visual thing but it's an imaginary thing so it takes you places uh, through your body's movement through it articulation of it whereas the painter especially the, the wall painter the painter who who puts paintings on a wall to look out uh, for you to engage with them uh, um, in whatever way you can uh, in that distance way um, it's a very different um, experience you know you can't touch the painting um, you can touch Tana's work with your feet. You can touch it with your hands. You can roll around on it. Uh, 
I sat down on it. Um, whereas there's always a pushback from painting and it's teasing you, you know, oh, should you touch, don't touch, do touch. My perspective uh, on the camera, which is down low, you can imagine a child running around there touching everything. They'd have to touch, whereas we're not allowed to touch. It's one thing you don't do with a painting. You, you just don't touch it. So there's, I have so many questions, I suppose, in relation to this work and the collaboration, which at the moment is um, a very positive word in the art world. You know, we have collectives, we have the Turner Prize coming up with just, with just collectives uh, in the UK. Um, collaboration is everywhere. Um, it's, it's in Arts Council funding. It's about um, community. It's about working together. I'm working with artists here. I'm working with something like eight artists at the moment in a collaborative process that involves a lot of trust. So I have loads of questions, I suppose, and it's something I might ask the two artists to discuss it. Um, what do you give, um, what do you, I suppose, sacrifice in collaboration? Uh, and what do you gain? When we think about collaboration, we always hear, uh, we hear it in a kind of positive way, but I don't think it's entirely positive. Um, but what they're doing in the complex is really interesting in that they're teaming up artists together and seeing what happens. I've always been interested in that. Uh, what is what the outcome of that is? Um, because artists usually are isolated. They're working alone. They're thinking uh, internally. There's no real conversation um, with another person, and there's no. Um, handing over, you know. Talent and Mark's work in Complex, they, it is segregated. They are two very two artists that are up against each other. Um, and the closest that they touch is that painting on the right hand side as you walk in, where the painting is is at the same height. Um, as Tana's platform. It's, it looks like it's sitting on it, but it's not. It's uh, an illusion. Um, so what I found interesting is that their works, do, they don't touch each other, I don't think. Now the screen does that and the screen is sitting at the entrance and it's Tana's work and Mark's work sitting on Tana's work. But it's quite transparent, it's quite invisible. It's not real mark making. It's not that mark is painted onto the platform. How would that, uh, how would that come about? Would you, could you allow that much trust in that collaboration? Um, you know, you think of, you know, Basket and Warhol painting over each other's paintings in that exhibition in the 80s which was seen as a, you know, a critical failure. Um, but that's something to think about that I don't see, I, in a way I see that screen as problematic. Um, I, I wasn't as engaged with that screen uh, as I was the paintings by themselves uh, and the floor by itself. Um, but my experience of that exhibition as a whole would be that Mark Sword's work, as I, as I say again, shouts the loudest. So you're pulled in the color texture, etc., And then over time, Tana's work starts to uh, rise off the floor and you start to see it and you, you try to engage with it uh, as best you can because it is a very uniform piece of furniture that has only one cut one kind of, it looks like an accident, but it's very intentional because the light is in there shining up. Um, and I'm wondering about that as well. Did it need it? Okay, um, that's gonna leave it there. And thanks for listening. Um, I'll be back again soon. Thank you.